Metro Talk Radio. You're in to all things music. You have a lot of really wacky religious things going on. A lot of times it can breed this cult of personality where it's not necessarily about the scripture or whatever. It's about the person up speaking and they kind of become the one that everybody's looking to. And, and one of the angels came to town, he was going to do like a week long revival. He started getting up talking about some weird name it, claim it kind of thing. And my dad just, he just got up and said, you know, we're done. He said, this is it. We're not going to preach that stuff in my church. <laughs> So that was it. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was, yeah. it was over. Yeah. Security. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Escort that man That's out. Great. Welcome to Intersect Radio, where music, faith, and life converge. With your host, Aaron the A Train Smith. everybody welcome to intersect radio oh man it's such a beautiful day outside today it's kind of difficult to be down here in the dungeon but um you know we got many more days like this to look forward i think look forward to and um before it gets hot and muggy and the mosquitoes and the tune bugs and stuff start coming out but uh anyway i'm glad to be here with you today and um my guest today is an old friend of mine. I haven't seen him in a while, but um, uh, I see his stuff on Facebook, and we stay kind of stay in contact like that. Um, he is a prolific songwriter, great guitarist. He's got several projects going on, and he's, he's in bands I'm sure you all know. Uh, the Choir, um, Lost Dogs. Kerosene Halo with Mike Rowe, and he's got solo projects. Uh, matter of fact, a new solo project coming out. That opening tune was called Unhypnotized. Uh, that's going to be on his um, forthcoming release, and it is none other than Mr. Derry Doherty. How are you, Derry? Hey, Aaron. I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm great. I'm great. I'm doing really good, man. I it's good to have you on the show. I'm glad you um, agreed to come on, and I'm looking forward yeah. to uh, I'm looking forward to uh, getting to know you better. You know, getting to know some things about you that I don't know, and and maybe the audience will get to know some things that they don't know. And um, all right, yeah, it should be good. Good time. Hopefully, so let's hopefully start all good things. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. It's all good here at Jazz Radio. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let, let's start from the from the beginning you're you're from california right yes i was born and raised in southern california in uh, cerritos california which is a little city kind of close to long beach for people that know anything about southern california right on the border of mm -hmm. orange county and la county mm -hmm. so when um, were you born? born born and raised here I was okay. born in 58, 1958. Okay. Yeah. All right. It must have been interesting times there in California in 1958. Man. Yeah, it was, you know, it, it was it, it was a good place to grow up. Yeah. That's for sure. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you start playing for, guitar? Uh, somebody was. Oh. Well, I was You're a beach guy? Beach for a fair, uh, well, no, because I'm fair-skinned and red-headed, so that was, a, that was the only downside. Because every time <laughs> I went to the beach, I turned into a lobster. <laughs> oh man okay so where did you start playing guitar and why um well my mother's side of the family I, it was all musical uh my uncles both 
in the late 40s and 50s had uh, Western swing bands that played out here on the West Coast. Um, mm. And my mother could play, you know, she could play piano and she could play banjo and mandolin and all kinds of stuff. So I, I got my first guitar. Um, oh, man, I was probably like five years old, something like that, when I got, they gave me a little guitar for my birthday. Was and, it just uh, something you I wanted, just, the guitar? No, I, ne- I didn't really even ask for it, but there was always guitars and stuff lying around the house. But this was like a little mm-hmm. um, Gibson. It, it was like a quarter size or half size guitar. I still have it, actually. It's a, called an L, L1 half is what it's called. Hmm. And um, it, was, it was, you know, I was kind of a small kid anyway, so it was good for learning because I could get my fingers around the fretboard and everything like that. Mm-hmm. But I was a real lazy practicer, so... Um, that always kind of got me in trouble, not practicing enough. Were you taking lessons? I took lessons a little bit when I was about, uh, I was about 12 or 13 and took, I had been taking piano lessons. My mom played piano too. So I'd been taking piano lessons and um, then started taking guitar lessons. With guitar, I mainly, every time I picked it up, I just wanted to sing a song. So it wasn't, I wasn't really trying to be this big technical guitar guy. I just wanted to, I just wanted to play and sing. So, mm-hmm. um, that led to me not being very studious about learning, you know, theory and things like that until later on. So, mm-hmm. so you knew right away you wanted to be a songwriter. I wanted to be a musician early on because music was such part of part of our family's life. Um, I actually, you know, my dream was to be a football player for the Dallas Cowboys. But um, well, all right, you know. We, when you graduate high school and you're only, uh, you know, five foot tall and 90 something pounds, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> did you play in high school? I did. Yeah. I went to a small school, um, called ambassador Christian. There was only, I think there were only 200 people in the school counting junior high and high school. Um, so basically it was anyone, any male that, you know, could get out on the football field and play, you got to play. Uh, right. and we played eight man football. We played eight man football, so it was um, huh. a little, uh, little different, more spread out kind of field and stuff. But yeah, I got to, I played a lot, three, three to four years of high school. I played. Yeah. What position did you play? I played defensive back, and then I returned kickoffs. All so right. yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun. Were you a speedster? I was pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. Back then, I was pretty fast in high school. Yeah, I could run well, run- and I had. I, I had pretty good hands, you know, so I could catch out of the backfield and stuff like that. So. Mm-hmm. Did you have to run track on the track team? Is that prerequisite? We didn't have, we didn't have, we didn't have a track team. Yeah, you know, we didn't okay. have a track team. And I didn't like baseball very much, so we didn't. Uh, I didn't play baseball. I tried playing basketball, but that was another thing I was way too short for. Um, mm-hmm. Just c- couldn't quite couldn't quite compete. How'd you become a Dallas Cowboy fan? Well, when I was, um, it was 1964, I think it was. And my father, I, I was raised in a Pentecostal preacher's house. My father was um, part of this denomination called Church of God of Prophecy, and it was out of Cleveland, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And so we would go back there every year. We'd, we'd fly back there every year for these worldwide assemblies, they called them, they would have. And um, that was back in the day where a lot of times you there was no direct flight. And so a lot of times you stopped and you actually had a layover for that day or something before you could catch your next flight. And we had a layover in Dallas for some reason for a day and a half and flew in and my dad took me to a Dallas Cowboy football game. And uh, it was the first football game I ever went to. And then he took me and bought me the little Dallas Cowboy helmet. And I was a fan ever since I'd raised my, my son is a fan. I raised him. He had no choice. He was indoctrinated from the very beginning. So <laughs> I tried to do that. And to my, my daughter. Kids were, well, yeah. my daughters just learned to stay out of the way when Dallas was playing, especially during all the bad seasons. They just they learned how to stay out of the living room when the uh, game was on when <laughs> the Cowboys were bad. Yeah, when uh, when I used to live in Sacramento, my kids. Uh, would go to school and be indoctrinated into loving the 49ers. So like oh, every right. day during, during football season, every day I have to like 
get them home and kind of reorientate them to the Cowboys and go and, and oh, yeah. really talk the 49ers down, you know, and get <laughs> yeah, them yeah. on my side. Well, and that, that's hard to do, too, because the 49ers-Cowboys rivalry was pretty big back then. Yeah. You know, you had, you had a lot of years where they were really going after each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were determined that it, it was – it would usually determine who was going to the Super Bowl. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, for quite a few years yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty intense. So mm-hmm. I didn't know you were – I didn't know you were a preacher's kid. Yeah, I was born and raised a preacher's kid, a little church. Uh, my dad – started a church in in Compton, actually. It was the first church. He had, I was actually born in San Diego, but we were only there for two years. And then he moved mm-hmm. up here to start a church, and it was a little storefront church in Compton. And then we bought some property up there that had a church already on it. And we were actually in my last memory of of that little church when I was a kid was the uh, the police coming in and uh, telling us that we had to get out because of the, the uh, riots, the watch riots started. And we were oh, right really? down by there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I remember as a kid looking, kind of being escorted out of the, of the area by police cars. And then you're kind of looking out the back window and just seeing things start to really kind of go crazy. Mm, wow. But, but yeah, but that was the last time. That was the last time we were there. Yeah. So what yeah. was it like was growing, pretty- growing up? as a preacher's kid? Well, it was, um, it was interesting. I mean, the, uh, you know, really the first memory of life that I have of being alive was waking up under the piano that my mother was playing in one of those all night gospel quartet singings. And I was laying on mm-hmm. a blanket and not just remember waking up and looking around and hearing all this noise. And that's like the first time I really realized I was a human being, you know, I was like, wow, what's going on here? You yeah. know? Um, but it was, you know, it was, there was a lot of good, a lot of bad. And, um, the one good thing that I always laugh about is that in a Pentecostal church, pretty much anybody can get up and do anything at any time they want. So, um, you know, you had a lot of people that like, for people like me who love to play music, I could, you know, I could play drums on the platform or I could play guitar or whatever for the song service. And even if you weren't very good at the time, nobody really cared. You know, it's kind of like hmm. the, the, that whole idea of just getting up and doing it for the Lord, you know, whatever you do. Yeah. Um, so that that was really good as far as, uh, you know, just musically, just being able to learn how to play okay. and, um, and all that. And then very similar, I'm sure, to, you know, with when you have a lot of uh, African-American singers and players that come out of, you know, more charismatic Pentecostal churches. It's like you get to hone your skill there. And yeah. um, it was the same kind of thing for me. I got to just kind of figure out how to improvise and play along to songs I really didn't know and all that kind of stuff. So it was it, a lot of good and, and then a lot of kind of crazy religious nutty So it was, a, it was a racially mixed congregation? Um, it was not. Our congregation was mm-hmm. not racially mixed. Okay. It was pretty much Southern white. It was like it was almost like you tra- transplanted a, a white small church from the south in the middle of Los Angeles. Oh, um, really? Now a lot of the yeah it was really interesting, but but a lot of the um, we'd have these you know different statewide events and conventions, and we we really mixed a lot with the African American churches of the Church of God, but they were, it was pretty separate at the time. Mm-hmm. It was pretty separate. Looking back, looking back on it, that was one of the things that really kind of bothered me about it. Okay. Okay. What was the, uh, give me one bad thing other than that, that was kind of bad about being raised in a, in a Pentecostal well, environment. You have, you have a lot of really wacky religious things going on and it, it breeds a lot of times it can breed this cult of personality where it's not about necessarily about, the scripture or whatever, it's about the person up speaking and they kind of become the one that everybody's looking to. And, and you see it a lot today with even in, in more charismatic churches, you can still see it, but it was just kind of thing where you'd have, you know, you'd have evangelists come through and all of a sudden they get up and start doing some, you know, talking about some wacky theology. I've had my dad cut people off and tell them that they were done. 
You know, <laughs> really? one, one evangelist came to town. Yeah, one evangelist came to town. He was going to do like a week long revival. He started getting up talking about some weird name it, claim it kind of thing. And my dad just, he just got up and said, you know, we're done. He said, this is it. We're not going to preach that stuff in my church. <laughs> So that was it. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was over. Yeah. Security. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Escort that man That's out. Great. Oh, man. So um, did you ever play in clubs and stuff as a teenager or anything? No, not as a teenager. No, I, it was all um, it was all Christian stuff. It was churches and, you know, park. They do the events at parks and things. Um mm-hmm. We were really active. Our youth group, we had a small church. We had a pretty big youth group. We had, at one point, um, in high, when I was in high school, we had probably 200 people that went to the church, but then we probably had another 150 kids that came from the neighborhood. Um, we yeah. had a really active youth group. And we would go down every week. We'd go down to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa for the concerts on Saturday nights. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so we did that from the time I was in junior high. I mean, I remember the, when the before the building was built, when they had the tent and everything. And I saw Andre Crouch down there one time, and um, seeing Larry Norman, you know, playing in the tent and Stonehill and all that when I was a kid. So um, we were pretty we were pretty active with all that stuff. But I didn't really start playing clubs till I my band was you know I was out of college and we started with what became the choir. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really when we just started playing. We could just play anywhere at, at that point. Yeah. So Chuck Smith was the pastor at that time. Yes. Yeah. Chuck Smith okay. was the pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And a guy named Jimmy so, uh, Kipner is the guy that ran ran the concerts. Okay. Yeah, we were having those same kind of concerts every other Saturday up in Sacramento at Warehouse. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We played up there a few times in the mid eighties. Yeah, you did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember seeing the 77s. There were a bunch of warehouse bands that came down to, I guess, kind of audition for the Calvary Chapel thing or something. And it was on a Saturday afternoon. And 77s played, and I think, um, I don't know if Vector played or not, but there were about three or four bands that played that were from the all from the warehouse. Mm-hmm. And that's, where I, that's wow. where I first met Mike, actually, was there. Okay. Wow. I went in, I kind of snuck, I kind of snuck in and watched the whole thing. So, uh-huh. um, they weren't too, yeah. I just remember not, them not being too pleased when Mike did his thing like where he fell on the ground and stuff. That was not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't, wasn't something they really liked. Oh man. I remember once we did this, uh, we did this concert out in LA at Pepperdine university. We're out in the big quad there. Mm-hmm. And Mike hit, and it was a cement floor, and um, Mike hit the ground, draped in a in an American flag, and just started rolling. Oh no! Around. Oh no! 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 Oh man! Uh, that's, a that's a good one. Thing. And about about fifteen yards from us, there was a guy actually standing on a milk crate. Preaching the gospel, you know, hell and brimstone. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, hellfire yeah. brimstone, you know. It was pretty weird. Oh, and man, then, yeah. And then you, then you look behind you and you see the beautiful Pacific Ocean, you know. So it's just like, it was pretty unreal. Yeah, what a, what a scene. <laughs> That's a weird scene right there. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what college did you go to? I went to, uh, the first year I went to this college called Pacific Christian College, which I thought, at that point, I I kind of thought, well, maybe I'll get into, you know, youth kind of youth ministry because I was part of the youth ministry thing at the church for a while, and uh-huh. uh, I just didn't like I didn't like it at all. I couldn't stand it, and that and that's when I really got had gotten serious about recording. Um, and so there was a college, Golden West College, out here that they had opened a recording program. It was pretty new uh, for there to be any kind of program like that. So I went over I just went over there for the next two years, and. Um, that's when I ended up doing, uh, getting a job working for Maranatha Music at their studio there in Costa Mesa. Okay. What were you doing there? So, I got a job as a second, started second as a second engineer and um, mm-hmm. got hired by a guy named Tom Roy who managed the place and uh, just 
got kind of thrown into the fire. I went, I ended up not, I never graduated uh, college because it was about, there's probably about four months left in the semester. And I got offered this paying job. And so I went to my professor that ran the program and I said, you know, I got this paying job. I don't think I can do both because it's going to be a lot of hours. And he was just like, if you got a paying job right off the bat as a second engineer, go do it because you're going to learn more there in the next four months than you are here. So oh, really? he said, that's what, that's what you, yeah, he said, he, he's the one that really said, he said, this is what you've been working towards. So go do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it was great. It was a lot of, yeah. it was a lot of work. How long did you do that? I worked there from 1979 uh, probably till about, off and on till till we started touring on pretty nonstop till about eighty five eighty six off and on, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. from seventy nine seventy nine to eighty eighty two, I was pretty much nonstop there. The mm-hmm. only thing I did at, at any other thing was to go out. I went out and toured with DA as a roadie on some tours with them. Okay. Oh. But yeah, it was so, fun. Uh, I got I got to work on a lot of records. Got to work work on a lot of uh, all kinds of records, like you know. They're not the music strings from anything like that to Chuck Gerard to, you know, uh, Paul Wilson from Sea Wind was doing some solo thing. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then and then all the stuff like Undercover and all the stuff that was happening in Alter Boys and all that. Um, they all, they did a lot of their records there. So oh, got really? to work on all that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. I didn't know they recorded at Maranatha. Yeah, well, it was called Whitefield. They changed the name to Whitefield. They sold it, I think it was about 1980, they sold it to um, that Christian singer, Evie, you remember her? That little uh-huh. blonde Christian singer. And her husband uh, was named Pele. He was, I guess, a big producer, songwriter over in uh, Sweden or Norway, one of the two. And so they bought the whole studio. They bought the building and everything. And uh, Miranatha still had their offices there and all of that, but, and they still use the studio, but it was owned by Evie and her husband and they changed the name to Whitefield studio. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where, uh, all the, the early undercover records and altar boys, uh, band called the lifters. They were like a rockabilly band. Um, Crystal Lewis sang with them in a band called Wobbly. There was a bunch of bands that recorded there. And then Daniel Lane, the Terry Taylor and them, Randy mm-hmm. Stonehill, I got to work on those couple Stonehill records, and um, but it was it was fun. It was a lot of a lot of sleeping on the couch, you know, for four hours, yeah, and then getting yeah. up and doing another session. But that's that's the way it goes in those in that that's business. The way it goes, yeah. <laughs> so growing up, growing up in a Pentecostal family, you you, uh, you were kind of had your sights set on maybe being a, a a minister to a youth minister or beyond. Yeah, well, think early you might on, be a pastor. Early on, no, I never thought I'd be a pastor. No, I thought too much okay. with my dad as far as just the pressure on him, and and I never wanted any of that. Um, mm-hmm. That's that's when right about the you know right about at the end of college is when I really knew that I was going to be a full time musician, an engineer. It would be, okay. it would be in music. Uh-huh. Um, but again, but again, the way you, the way I was raised, it was always you know, I always thought I'd be in just Christian music, and not. There was it wasn't until the band started going that we actually thought, well, maybe we can get a regular record deal, you know. Uh-huh. Um, but before that, it was always you know the highlight for us was the first time we played Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. I thought I had just made the big time. At that point, <laughs> I thought, man, how does it get me? How does it get me bigger than this? You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's cool. So tell me, how did you meet um, Steve and Dan and those guys and, and form the choir? Well, I was with um, Daniel Lane. We started going down the road with Daniel Amos, with Terry and them. And uh, they were looking, Marty, their bass player, Marty Deckmeyer, had just left the band. He decided he didn't want to tour anymore. And so they were looking for a bass player. And Terry had asked me, he said, do you play bass? And I said, no, I'm not very good. I said, but I know a guy because I, I knew Tim Chandler through my old high school. His brother taught at my high school. Mm-hmm. And Tim would show up and he would show up at the school and 
um, just kind of hang out in the afternoons, you know, and stuff. So I got to know him there and then um, introduced him to Daniel Amos. And in the meantime, Steve and Tim were at Azusa Pacific University together, and they played in the jazz band, and they played some other bands for the school, um, and were, became pretty good friends. And I always had some band going, and I told Tim, I, I said, man, we should start a band. And he's going, oh, I know this drummer, Steve. And so we got, our first time we got together just to play together was in Steve's parents' living room. Mm-hmm. And we just kind of set up there, and, and we were playing together. We started, Steve and I have been together ever since. Cool. What did you play? Since you hadn't written anything yet, what? Oh, how did you? No, we just played. Well, I was writing. I was writing songs. I was writing songs okay. at that point, and Steve was writing. He was writing a lot of lyrics. So we were. Mm-hmm. That was like early on when we were trying to figure out how to write together. Uh, uh-huh. But I had a bunch of songs. I had a bunch of songs already, and so we started playing those first. They weren't very good. I wouldn't want anybody to even hear them or anything. But <laughs> um, that's you know that's what we started playing. And then we started doing, uh, you know, we started going out and playing uh, high schools. Like they had a thing in Maranatha called the Ministry Resource Center. It was all these new young bands like us and Alter Boys and Undercover. And, um, we would p- go out and play. They'd pay you to go play a high school at lunchtime during the week. And we'd all play different high schools at lunch around Orange County. And then we'd, we'd do like two or three there'd be two or three different shows on Friday and Saturday nights, concerts and churches, and they'd get all these kids to come. Mm-hmm. And uh, so for us, it was great because, you know, you're a couple, couple of college guys, you're just out of college, and all of a sudden you get, you know, you're getting 50 bucks for the day to go play the high school. Yeah. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a really good, it was a really interesting time because you, we were playing every week and every weekend. I mean, there was something going on all the time. Uh-huh. And uh, really, really exciting. I'm sure same thing up with you guys up in Sacramento. You know, it's that that in time of innocence where everything is just good. Yeah. And if you haven't run into any of the big of the business part of it yet, you know, and um, it's just fun because you're just out with your friends and you're playing, and you know, there's kids coming to the shows and and everything's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Until you hit those speed bumps. Oh you yeah. Know. Well, and then all of a sudden, like like with anything else, innocence is lost after a while, and you. Uh, yeah. That's when you really have to kind of figure it out, you know, with your faith and everything else. So. So how did the recordings come about? How did your re- record deals and stuff? Well, they um, the first rec our first record came out on um, Broken Records, which was a company that. Maranatha had started for the, for the young, these young bands mm-hmm. and, uh, Tommy, Coons, Tommy Coons, who was in love song and all that, he was kind of overseeing it. And he signed us. It was just like a one-off deal. It wasn't even really a deal. It was like a one page contract, like we'll pay for a record. And, uh, so we did the record, but we had to do it during, it wasn't really fun for Steve because we, she was working a full-time job and I was working at the studio, but we had to do it kind of during off time at the studio and a lot of times Steve was working. So we decided, well, we'll use a drum machine just to put all the guitars and everything down. And then we'll get Steve in, you know, for a couple of days when he can come in and play and get all his drums. But mm-hmm. then the producer, the guy that produced it got real attached to the drum machine. And he, by the time Steve could come in and play, was like, Oh, let's keep this on drum machine. And, let's, and so Steve was just really bummed about it. Um, he, and, and he should have been. He didn't get a chance to. We we would have made a better record if he'd have been allowed to play drums on that first yeah. choir record. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing about demos, man. You know, whoever's producing it almost gets so oh, attached I, to it. You know. Oh, I know. They, I know. You know. And, and yeah, at that, that time, you know, the technology was changing. The technology was changing, and everybody mm-hmm. was trying to do this drum machine thing, and we didn't. We didn't like it. Mm-hmm. You know, but it was everything was kind of moving away from that. Um, so we did that record, and then uh, started touring around, playing uh, places out of state, and um, went to Cornerstone. We were, we were the first band on at the first Cornerstone, and that really changed things because people from all around the country got to see us play. Right, mm-hmm. and a lot of a lot of places, you know, a lot of parts of the country, they didn't know anything like that 
like the West Coast Jesus movement thing. They didn't know that that even existed. Mm-hmm. And we were kind, of, you know, we were kind of the second wave of that, or even third wave of that, really. But um, so it opened up a lot of avenues for us to go out and tour across the country. And we knew that we couldn't stay in LA. We we weren't the big the big draws here were Undercover and Alter Boys were the two big and Lifesavers. They were the three big bands. <clears throat> so we were kind of second tier here, and we knew that if we were going to do anything, we needed to get out of state and get to some places mm-hmm. where people hadn't seen us before and just kind of get our name out there. Yeah. So how did you do it? Um, well, like I said, Cornerstone was a big, that was a big starting point. And then I just got on the phone. There was a couple tours. We just got on the phone and we just booked shows. We called Calvary Chapels. We called the churches and we said, Hey, we're coming to town. Can we play? And because we played at Costa Mesa, um, and we're up through the ministry resource thing, the Maranatha the music thing. We had an in with them. Um, so we the first couple tours that we did as youth part, we just booked ourselves. And, you know, saw the guy, you're all in the van. You got like six guys in the room at a Motel 6. You know, you flip the coin to see what two sleep on the bed. And everybody <laughs> else sleeps on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you ever stay at somebody's yeah, house? We did a few times early on, and that was and it was forget it. We're never doing that again. Yeah, it was not wasn't pleasant. We had we had one. We stayed at this one woman's house. She was like a big fan, and she we stayed at her house. And it was her and her father. They had this big house, and her father was like this mean, cranky guy from the other room. He just kind of always stayed in the other room. You never saw him, and. Huh. So we, we get up, she, she's like, I'm going to make you guys a great breakfast tomorrow, you know, before you leave. And so we get up and I went around and she's not there. And like a, half an hour goes by and then she comes back. She's got all these eggs and bacon and stuff. She's in the kitchen cooking, cooking, but nothing's ever coming out. She's not bringing anything to the table. And we're just going, what's going on? And so she comes back in and she says, you know, I got to go back to the store um, and get some more eggs. She goes, I kept tasting the eggs and they weren't very good. And I thought, you know, if I'm not going to, if I wouldn't serve this to Jesus, I'm not going to serve it to the band. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so we're sitting there going, you know, we'll eat anything. And, and it's kind of like, we're two hours late now. So we got, we got to get out of here. And so she ended up going, and then all of a sudden you hear the, you hear the dad in the back of the room and you go, are those guys gone yet? Are they out of the house? And so was, we went through, uh, there was a I few thought, things like that. I and, thought maybe he was and, eating and that's when, all the that's Oh, no, 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 no. We ended up getting, I think, one egg apiece out of the whole thing after about two dozen eggs being cooked and thrown away. So, oh, man. Yeah. Wow. So what what was your favorite experience, uh, you know, during those early days and uh, of touring and getting your music heard? And Well, I think the first, the, the biggest thing – first big thing that really made an impact was when um, we played uh, Calvary Costa Mesa and we had our first record had just come out, the youth choir record. And they had a store called Maranatha Village that was part of the church, but it was in a separate location. It was a big Christian bookstore, all kinds of Christian records. And so all these other bands, you know, you'd, you'd always go to the show, the concert, and then afterwards you'd go to the bookstore and you'd buy the record and the band would be there, you know, whether it was the way or Daniel Amos or whoever. And um, so we, we did the concert and then we had our album release at the bookstore and it was packed with people and, you know, they want us to sign the record. And that was like a really cool moment to realize that, you you know, you were kind of were making an impact a little bit. Mm-hmm. That was, that was really fun. And then, and then playing Cornerstone for the first, you know, first Cornerstone, that was overwhelming, you know, because it was uh, so many people and, all these other bands that we'd admired over the years and um, being able to, to play that yeah. uh, was a real, that, that was a really big deal. Mm-hmm. Now you were called a youth choir at first. Mm-hmm. We were called youth choir. And then um, mm-hmm. we ended up, we ended up, Terry Taylor's the one that thought of that name. We were just trying to find a name because we, we were going to play a couple concerts and we didn't have a name. Mm-hmm. So we, Terry just goes, oh, you guys are all preachers, guys, kids, you know, youth choir, call yourself youth choir. 
We thought, okay, whatever Terry says, we'll do it. And um, <laughs> so, so we had that. And then we did, uh, after the Maranatha record, we did some demos and we were going to put them out as a little uh, five song EP. And we got signed to this um, label called Shadow, which was owned by this guy named Ray Now, And he was a guy from the East Coast and he, you know, made a big impression and signed us to a contract and it was like a big budget, you know, it was like, here, I'm going to give you guys $35,000 to make a record. And we're saying, wow, man, that's worth it. It's the big time. And uh, so, so then he put us, he, he pressed it. He said, you guys press up the EP and uh, I'm going to get you on tour with opening for Steve Taylor. And uh, so we went out, we were out for about four months with Steve Taylor and um, he said, I'll pay you guys, you know, $150 a show or whatever, plus hotel rooms and you can sell your merch. And, um, but I come to find wow. out the guy didn't have any money. He didn't, he didn't have any money. So mm-hmm. all through the tour, we're having to call him and try and, and beg and say, Hey man, we got to have money. We don't have gas to do the next show. And he was all some excuse, you know, one time he gave us a check and it bounced and, there was no funds in there, you know, the whole thing. And it was, Mm. um, it was kind of eye opening. You know, we were just stuck around the middle of nowhere and we're trying to do shows and we're stuck. And so at the end we ended up in, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania and we drove to his house after the last show and knocked on his door and we go, we gotta have, we gotta have, it's like, we gotta have money to get home. We don't have any gas money. We'll drive straight through. We won't stop. And he's like, I don't have it. You guys, I don't have it. And, and so Steve and I had to call our parents and get them to wire us money so that we could get home from our, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Wow. And so we drove, we drove straight through, you know, straight, no stop. And we just traded off, slept in the van. Mm-hmm. Straight through. And we got back and we got a call from uh, Word Records, Murr Records, from this guy, Tom Willett, who was an A&R guy there. And he said... I heard you guys signed the shadow and we're like, well, yeah, but we want to get out of that. He's like, I'll get a lawyer and we'll get you out. Hmm. So he got a look. So he did got this guy, a did he, did, did he actually come up with the $35,000 to make the record? No, nope. we never made a record for him. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. we, the, the EP that we did that was on his label imprint, we had already paid for it ourselves. All right. And we per- paid for the pressing and everything. No, he never gave us a dime. We didn't get one dime from him. Wow. Yeah, he was just kind of a shyster. One awesome. of those early day, early day mistakes. Yeah. Made. So, uh, Murr Records. Yeah, so we got signed to Murr, and we did four records for them. And uh, the last two came out on one came out on A and M, and one came out on Epic. What they call a pass through, which is basically uh, A and M takes the record that we made for them and just distributes it distributes it, you know, to get it into all rec- all the record stores, like Tower and everything else. Mm-hmm. But it usually ends up in the Christian section as opposed to the real. Like I would oh, go yeah. to Tower, I would go to record stores in the area and I would go to the Christian section and take out the choir records and then put them in the regular C's. <laughs> so that they'd be in the <laughs> regular C's. Yeah. And that's when, we changed know, our name to the, that's when we changed that's when we changed our name to the choir, by the way, too. When we signed a word, he, okay. uh, Tom was like, why don't you just, why don't we just wipe this dad stuff away and change your name to the choir. It's, sounds mm-hmm. a little more current. You know, so we thought, okay, we'll do that. Do you know Randy Layton? Oh yeah. I know Randy. Yeah. Randy used to time. do that. Yeah. Randy used to do that with 77s records and stuff. He was selling up in Oregon. He would go through the stores oh, yeah. and move, move the records around. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I used to go. Through, I used to do that all the time. <clears throat> so, how long did you, you? When did you move to Nashville? We moved in 1993 in October. Well, Steve and I went out a couple months earlier. We went out, I think, about August of 1993, and then our families uh, all came out in October of '93. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we went out. We went out and tried to find places to live and. Uh, kind of get settled in and um, then our families came out, you know, we drove a bunch of big truck, U-Haul trucks out with our stuff. I had all of my studio equipment, mm-hmm. all of that. So um, wow. we got there 
So it was 1993, and I remember the, the family came in, and it was Halloween, and we were taking uh, our, our kids were really young, and we were taking them trick-or-treating at a friend's house, and uh, it, was the year, it was a year in Tesla where it was like the biggest winter freeze that they'd had in, you know, 70 years or something. And uh, it was snowing. It started snowing on Halloween, and, and we were just kind of looking at each other going, what did we get ourselves into? <laughs> we were just in the sunshine, and now we're in the snow. Uh, <laughs> what was your experience like living here in Nashville? Amongst the oh, Christian music community, yeah. Well, it was it, it was interesting at first because it's it's a hard uh, it's kind of a hard click to get into. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you um, when you're out, especially coming from LA, because we re- we knew some people, but we didn't know uh, the insiders there. You know, mm-hmm. very well, and so it took a little while. You know, we, we were kind of the outsiders, and it took a little while to kind of get acclimated to what uh you know to what the how it worked out there but fortunately mm-hmm. we moved out with it with a lot our whole band and the families and we already had some other people that had moved out before us that we knew so we weren't just kind of stuck trying to make new friends right off right away mm-hmm. we um we were able to um you know kind of have our own group of friends already. So, mm-hmm. and most people were really, most people were very friendly. They were, um, you know, real sweet. And, and it just took, kind of took a while to get into the production scene and all that. Cause we had been producing records out here and we had our people to work with out here, but we didn't have anything really new out there to do. So, um, mainly we lived out there so we could tour better. We could tour more efficiently from out there. Right. Right. That's, that's a big plus for most musicians or, or groups that live here it's centrally located for touring you know you got four of the major freeways that cross the united states all intersect here in nashville so oh, i know it makes it, i know it makes it pretty easy so and especially when, when you start you, having kids oh yeah when you oh, when you yeah. start having kids you don't want it like for us it took us you know three or four days to get where we were going because we didn't really play the West coast that much. And so for mm-hmm. us, it was like three days to get there and the extra three days and the extra three days to get back. So all of a sudden you're gone a lot longer than you want to be gone. Mm-hmm. Right. And Nashville made that easier. So what are you up to these days? You're back in California. Back in California. I've been out here. I came out here about three and a half years ago to take care of my, my father got ill. And mm-hmm. um, when I first came out, we didn't think he was going to live probably more than a month, a few weeks or a month. And, um, he was down, you know, his weight had gone way down and I just kind of stayed with him and nursed him back to health and, and, um, made sure he ate, fed him three times a day and made sure he drank a lot of water and got him out for in his wheelchair to, to push him around to get some sun. And all of a sudden he started getting his strength back. And so he, so he kept lasting and lasting. And I went back to Nashville for a little while couple months and but then he got sick again and so I came back out and at that point I realized you know I'm just going to be here till he passes and I'll figure out what I'm going to do because um, mm-hmm. I wanted him I didn't want him to have to put him in a, a rest home I wanted him to be able to die in this house which he wanted um, mm-hmm. so it was a it was a great experience so I wouldn't trade it for anything it was I packed up my studio and closed it down and brought some gear out here and um it was, it was a really good time being with him Mm -hmm. and he and I've always been close. We've always been close. So, um, it was just kind of a nice way to end it, to be able to be with him for that, that long. So, uh, so yeah, so not, you know, during that time I did a couple tours, smaller tours. Um, and I'd have my sister would come down and stay with my dad and then some people from the church. Uh, but then about the last year and a half, he started really getting bad to where I knew that I couldn't leave anymore um, mm-hmm. and until he passed. I couldn't really do anything. I said that I was just at his full-time caregiver. Um, and in the meantime, I had started a Kickstarter for, I was going to do a solo record. And so that drug out a lot longer than I thought, but it's coming out. Um, it's coming mm-hmm. out. It's all done coming out, coming out in June. And um, cool. yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward for people to hear the whole thing. And then it's a yeah. good record. And, 
Well, the, yeah. that tune we opened the show with, Unhypnotized, I really like that. I, I listened to that this morning. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, I really like that. Uh, what was the, what, what, where are you coming from in that lyric? I well, especially, I, I, I especially like the last line. I saw an angel shooting up, or what was it? I saw, I saw oh, an angel heroin. shooting yeah. heroin. Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah the, the, the original idea I had was those first, the first two lines, the last, two last lines are, um, I saw, I heard the devil sing a gospel hymn. I saw an angel shooting heroin. And that mm-hmm. came from, um, first of all, just my upbringing, the way, you know, you'd get these guys to come in, they'd come in and want to preach or whatever, and all of a sudden you'd realize that they're really kind of charlatans. Mm-hmm. But yet they're going through the motions, they're singing the hymns, they're doing the whole thing. And, and if you didn't know, you would just think that they're the greatest people in the world, and then all of a sudden things start happening, and you realize, you know, that's not a good person. Mm-hmm. And then the angel shooting heroin was just uh, kind of came from my oldest daughter went through a uh, pretty much a really about five year period of, of really bad uh, depression and addiction. Mm. And um, she, she didn't use heroin, but she pretty much used everything else and came to kind of the end of her rope. And she's been sober now four years, going on four years, um, okay. which is great. But it was just that it's like, there's no, the whole idea being that there, you know, you can't, just look at things from the outside and say they're one way, you know, mm-hmm. beautiful people, wonderful people get stuck in bad situations and end up doing harmful things. And, mm-hmm. and bad people end up in really good situations and make, they make you think that they're the second coming of Jesus or something. Just yeah. that dichotomy of that. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I, yeah, I, and there's I another really line. Like there's song. another line in that song. Well, there's another line in that song that that um, uh, I was born in the West Coast, raised in the South. Uh, because my parents were Southern, they're Alabama, Arkansas, so it was like this very Southern upbringing in the middle of Southern California. And then um, mm. the one line, I saw a spider crawl from a slain woman's mouth. That that's like the one thing with my upbringing that I can't uh, explain. And it was in a church service when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And this woman, they were praying for her because somebody said she had a demon in her or whatever. And so they were praying for her and she kind of passed out on the floor. And all of a sudden this kind of black spider crawled out of her mouth Whoa. and it kind of crawled out, crawled out her mouth and crawled around the wall and disappeared. And Whoa. my friends and I were, my friends and I were sitting there watching it. And almost everything else with Pentecostal stuff I can explain. But that's the one thing to this day that kind of haunts me because I cannot explain. Can't yeah. explain what it was, why it happened. Um, you know, it's just one of those weird, one of those weird things that happens sometimes. Wow. You just go, man, I don't, yeah. it's something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> that is weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, we're coming close to the end of our hour here, and I want you to tell people, uh, give them all your information about contacts and where you're going to be this summer and stuff like that. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we've got um, – we're playing some festivals. We're play- The choir is playing uh, Joshua Fest in Northern California, and that is uh, the – I think it's the, 20, the weekend of the 20th of July – and we're playing on mm-hmm. the Sunday, which is, I think, 22nd or something like that. And also at that festival, Lost Dogs are playing. And then um, Terry and Mike and Steve and I are all playing solo acoustic sets there, too. So it's going to be kind of a long day of, of us playing. Mm. Um, and then we are playing a show. The choir is playing a show August 4th with the Prayer Chain in Nashville. We're opening for them. They're doing the, the uh, 25th or 20th anniversary of sh- their Shawl record. And they haven't played together okay. in 15 years. So we're playing, we're opening wow. for them in Nashville and it's at the uh, cannery right ballroom, the cannery, okay. the cannery ballroom. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. And then the, the choir, we're doing a house show the night before the choir at Dan Elise's house, an acoustic thing. Um, mm-hmm. We've got, I've got my record that comes out in June and the choir record. They just released the downloads today to the Kickstarter supporters. And that record will come out 
um, at the end of May. It's coming out first. Okay. And then we're going to tour. Uh, we're going to be after after the August fourth show. The plan is to be on the road for most of August and September, and then um, come back to the West Coast in October and tour out here. Mm-hmm. As the choir, so we might. It, as the choir, yeah, and, and it's looking. It, it's looking like we might be doing a tour. The first part, the first part of the tour, in the South with this band, Small Town Poets, who, who yeah. have. Uh, They've been around for a long time, but they haven't. They, I don't think they've done a record in a while. But they've got a new record coming out, and they, their management called them and want, wanted us to go out and, and play with them if we were interested. And so we thought, why not? We mm-hmm. never got to play with them before, so that'd be fun. Cool. So it's going to be a busy late summer and fall. It's going to be nice. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Is Steve out in California? Or is he here in Nashville? No, he's still in Nashville. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's still he's yeah, still yeah. in Nashville. He. He he won't be coming back out. I mean, he'll come back out here to work and stuff, and with me, but he won't live out here probably. Mm-hmm. We played together at Audio Feed last year with um, oh, Sean that's Michelle. Right. Yeah, it was fun. That's was right. He, he told me that. Yeah, that's cool. That's really we cool. That a, guy's great. We had a really good time, man. <laughs> yeah, <I> bad. <laughs> had a great time, and Jimmy, you know, yeah, you know Jimmy yeah, in the oh, mix. Yeah. You know, you got it's got to be a pretty wild time. Oh, I know. I love Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. So, you know. Yeah, I miss, I miss seeing all those guys back there. I get yeah. to go back enough to where I, I get my I get my fix, you know, and come back well, out here. Yeah. Come back and get some southernness. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, yep. man, that's great. I might, I might see you this summer. Um, uh, in July, it's it's a possibility. Oh, okay, I might Joshua okay. Fest. Yeah, that'll be a good hang. Yeah, yeah. Is Mike going to be there? I've ever played there? Mike will be there too. Yeah. Okay. Well, if Mike is going to be there, that's going to be great because uh, if I'm at the festival, I'm going to be there with Kevin Max, and Kevin just recorded a version of Ba Ba Ba, and he had talked oh, about nice. uh, having. Yeah, he had talked about having Mike come up and play, and uh, it'll be a for me and Mike. So, so that'd be fun. That'll be great. Yeah, Mike will be there for sure because yeah. the, uh, the Lost Dogs are playing. And then uh, cool. Mike is also playing a solo set, too. So That's right. All of yeah, you are so playing solo there. sets, right? Okay. Yeah, That's all, cool, all man. four of us are from Lost Dogs. And then the choir's playing a set that Mike is going to play bass with us on. So he'll oh, be he's playing bass. <laughs> yeah. He's going to play bass for us. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. That'd be, nice. call that'd, be fun. that'd be a nice festival. Yeah. I got to call Steve because uh, I want to have him on the show. Oh, so nice. If, oh yeah. If, he'd you, talk to to if you talk to him, if you talk to him, you pull his coattail. I will. I'll talk tell to him, him today at some point. So. Tell, tell him to get over here. I will. I will. Uh. Well, clock on the wall says we're about out of time here. So um, I appreciate you taking the time out to uh, carve out an hour to be on the show today. And, um, man, I really look forward to seeing you and, and hope hope that I am there at the festival. It'll be a great hang. Oh man, yeah, I can't wait to see you guys there, and it'll be really fun. I can't, and you know what? I can't thank you enough for having me on. It's been been great to be on your podcast, and hopefully, we'll do it again sometime. Yeah, man, that'd be great. Tell all your friends um, it should be up sometime today, uh, a couple hours okay. or so, and uh, I look forward to seeing right, the feedback. Sh- I, 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 I know sh- you got a lot of pals it. out there. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we do. Derry, it's, it's, thank it's good. All right, man. Yeah. Thank you so much, Derry. All right, thank you. Okay, appreciate you.
This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Miola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. 